This morning, we hear the stories of Naaman and the healing of the ten lepers, bound together by commonplace, common disease, and common cure. These stories illuminate much about our ex- expectations around God and each other. Naaman was a great man. He was in high favor with his master. His master, a king, was one who had great claim to power, and Naaman himself also had a great claim as commander over his master's army. However, his success is not attributed to Naaman himself or to his master. Rather, God is the one who has given Naaman military success. Many would assume, by looking at him, that Naaman had the favor of the gods, were it not for his leprosy. Fortunately, a cure is discovered, a long shot, this prophet of another people and nation, someone extraordinary, outside of the realm and the resources of care Naaman already has. Extraordinary measures would be taken, Naaman consults the king of Aram. He writes an appropriate letter to the king of Israel to send along with Naaman and his party. Naaman takes a vast treasury with him, silver, gold, elaborate garments, and this letter, hoping to bargain for the services of the prophet, for the miracle cure. Naaman assumes the prophet is one who works for the king, not the other way around. The king of Israel almost comedically upsets Naaman's idea of how this will go. Am I God? Certainly not. Elisha, the prophet, hears of this encounter and invites Naaman to come to his home so that God's power may be shown on full display even over one outside the household of Israel. Now, when Naaman gets to the prophet's house, he's not invited in. No such hospitality is extended. Instead of the five-star treatment or the magic cure or some grand pronouncement, he is told to simply go and wash and make himself clean. Elisha doesn't even come out to speak to him. He sends a messenger. Naaman is at first slighted and frustrated. Has he not washed himself before in much clearer water? Has he not traveled all this way for a miracle? How could something so ordinary deliver the relief he desperately sought? Something that gold and silver and military prowess and power cannot give him. Fortunately, with the intervention of his servants, he tries the cure and he is cured. It shatters his preconceptions. It causes a conversion. He returns to Elisha and now gains an audience in order to state his newfound faith. There is no God in all the earth except in Israel. God asks us to be faithful, and God is faithful to us even when we are not. Naaman shows us what it is like to seek out God while seeking healing, seeking wholeness. Naaman is a powerful man, yet he is still a human, still a creature, bound by that same problem of mortality that we all are. And Naaman's use of his power is illustrative to us. It shows us that When we stand in the way of our own faith, our own salvation, that God will remain faithful to us. God first speaks to Naaman through a captive Israelite girl, leading him to seek God out. Naaman has no reason to believe this story from this person, yet somehow, for some reason, he is drawn to this prophet of Israel looking for God among the powerful and those of his contemporary class, the king of Israel, first, he has to redirect Naaman. 
I am not God. I do not have the power over life and death. That is God alone. The king of Israel rightly points to God, not pretending to hold God's power for his own. Naaman's power, his bargaining, is frustrated again, first by taking advice from someone below his class and then by this diplomatic kerfuffle. When Naaman arrives at the proper place, finding that a prophet is not one who speaks pleasantries to kings and rulers, but one who speaks the truth to all. Naaman expects a miracle, plus he wants some special treatment. Yet Elisha does not give this powerful man an audience. Furthermore, his cure is something so ordinary that it could not, would not work. Naaman takes offense at this means of a cure. Surely the prophet of God could perform the miracle on the spot. Furthermore, we see a hint of tribalism. Those waters are not the waters of my homeland more pure? Are they not better than these foreign, dirty waters? Naaman's own notion of his own importance threatens his salvation. It causes him to turn away. Naaman's opinions of those outside of his own people further stands between him and God. Surely God can't work through them. Yet God does work through them. Working through his servants, God offers Naaman one more chance. Would you not do this cure, they say, if it was some difficult challenge? Why then would this simple task cause you to turn away? Be faithful. Follow through. Don't let your ego, don't let your power stand between you and wholeness. Come wash yourself clean in the river Jordan and be healed. God asks us to be faithful. And God is faithful when we are not. At the end of the story, Naaman recognizes what we knew all along. God is God. The Lord acts through ordinary earthly means to restore Naaman to health. God does not need wealth or earthly power in order to be God. God is content to work through the ordinary for human flourishing and salvation. Naaman's tribute does not win him a cure. It is an acceptance of these ordinary things through which God works out his salvation. As Christians, too, we believe God works through ordinary things to effect our salvation. God takes our offerings of bread and wine and turns them into his own flesh and blood, offered for our sake on the cross and given to us to sustain us in our earthly pilgrimage. God takes water to cleanse us from sin and graft us into Christ's body, the church. Each Sunday we come together to do what appears to be an ordinary thing, sharing a meal or going to a community gathering. Yet we're told that there's a mystery, this mystery, something extraordinary, that this is the place where heaven and earth will meet, and that we are called to take up our seats at God's own table. Jesus does the same thing in today's gospel, pointing out the faithfulness of the tenth leper, the one who is healed and returns to worship the Lord. This leper is a foreigner as well, a Samaritan, one of low standing, living outside the village, separated from others by his illness. We are drawn to the font, to the altar, and to Jesus, seeking not just physical healing, not just a solution to whatever earthly problem we have, but something greater. And in the course of our lives, God offers us chance after chance after chance to draw closer to that salvation, to draw closer to being made well. And that is by being truthful. That is by being faithful. 
That is by letting go of our own biases and fears. That is by letting go of our own power and control so that we can learn to be faithful. We can learn to accept ordinary things as means of grace, and we can learn to see God's providence in places that we do not expect. We can learn to be gracious, offering our sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to God and uniting our praise into one great thanksgiving. And in our faithfulness, we can learn to be watchful, looking for the opportunities to point others beyond us, beyond themselves, to the life-giving God, one who makes all things new.